Good afternoon, all. Assalamualaikum. I am Muzammil Yaqub uh, here with another session for In Dialogue Foundation, and a very warm welcome to you all and our guest, Dr. Sayyid Tahseen Razaer from Aligarh Muslim University. Uh, I I am also a participant. I was a participant in this course back in 2020, and now I volunteer with In Dialogue Foundation. And Dr. Raza is joining us today, and he'll be speaking on the topic. in a fragile world religion reconciliation dialogue and peace dr uh, raza is an assistant professor in the department of strategic and security studies faculty of international studies uh, aligarh muslim university previously he has taught at the department of political science miranda house uh, university of delhi new delhi and also at the department of political science and center for women's studies mu aligarh an expert in international politics and security he currently focuses on gender peace and security and has an interest in establishing and popularizing security and peace studies programs in india his most recent work the united states and pakistan in the 21st century geostrategy and geopolitics in south asia was published by rotlage in 2021 and has been quite well received by the academic circles Uh, sir we have around 2 hours to wrap up the session and we will we can have as much time for the questions and answers over to you sir thank you uh, mr muzammil and uh, was pleasantly surprised to see you because uh, 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 for other participants uh, uh, i'm not say muzammil has been my student i will rather say he had been a co-learner with me when i began my teaching career uh, from aligarh muslim university in pak and at the start of my master so very happy to see you and of course other participants and uh, i am uh, particularly thankful to uh, in dialog foundation and of course to uh, mr bezas sir for two reasons particularly because uh, i had to come earlier but uh, because of some other engagements i had to postpone and uh, I really should have been informed earlier, but I informed at a later stage. And even though uh, Mr. Bezad was kind enough to uh, uh, be okay with that, and then uh, we came with a different date, twentieth uh, of December, that's still there. And uh, uh, kudos to the In Dialogue team because uh, uh, at this juncture, uh, when the world over, there is the loss of hope. uh there seems to be the loss of hope in every sense uh, but uh, in the alo foundation is still uh, highlighting and then uh, uh, working uh, uh, for the promotion of uh, of concepts such as dialogue and uh, the promotion of peace in this in this fragile world so in fact the tough time deciding the topic that what to what to say what to uh, say to the Uh, uh participants uh when uh, in front of our own eyes we can see the i don't have uh, adequate adject- adjectives to use brazen you can say uh, naked violation of uh, international norms international law everything and then in such a situation we have to uh, uh, because they teach students uh, undergrad students here and then uh they actually come with very very difficult questions and of course uh, they must and they should uh, because the way the uh, international uh, uh, organizations and the places which is considered to be the epitome of the highest body of deliberative functioning the united states the united nations uh, the manner in which it is it is being uh, paralyzed so amidst all these uh, realities of the world these current realities of the world and uh, the thing is we can now uh, watch and see everything it's it's very much in front of our eyes so we can see the images of the dead and the dying in uh, gaza and we can also see the way uh, the things are being uh, moderated in for example uh, the del- deliberative body of the uh, united nations and the way the talk between the uh, parties of different groups and different state parties are actually debating things on uh, uh, 
uh, different uh, foras, uh, uh, CNN and, and, and other international news platform. So, uh, in the light of these, my uh, uh, discussion with or interaction with uh, all of us uh, for this uh, uh, 45, 60 minutes uh, will be more based uh, towards seeing if there is any possibility of making amend in the existing situation, in the existing uh, uh, problematic uh, uh, aspects, which is which the world current confronts with. And if uh, uh, there is any mechanism, there is any way. Why is it that it is it is not being utilized? It is not being used. It is it is not being uh, it is not uh, uh, properly uh, accounted. Uh, the counting is done. So what I intend to do is uh, uh, in the initial uh, uh, part of my uh, discussion, uh, I'll try to see how has been the development in the past. And uh, why is it that the problems keep repeating, keep occurring? And it seems that there is a loop and we are unable to come out of that loop. So we see, uh, for example, and we discussed with our students, uh, international politics students, that the first world, was first world war took place. And then there was this League of Nations. League of Nations came up with came up with hope, and then that hope was again uh, that led to the uh, Second World War, and then the Second World War happened without its bloodshed and killing and 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 all the barbarities there, and then the United Nations came, and then this uh, Cold War, and then uh, the post Cold War situation, and and then uh, for some. Uh, it seemed that, and uh, particularly those of us, all of us, most of us, I should rather say, imbued in the Western liberal tradition, we tend to think, and uh, the way our orientation has been done, the way we have studied things, the way we uh, uh, quote things or study things or study scholars, the way religion has been put to a particular lens, that also actually is also quite problematic, particularly in the light of the secularization uh, theory, uh, which as of now seems to not go the way it was uh, actually and ideally expected to. So in the light of this, what uh, uh, I'm going to do uh, in this uh, brief time with you is to begin with the way the things have happened in the past, the things occurring now, and then try to tap on the potentials, try to tap on those sites, those places, those uh, uh, avenues, which hitherto have either been untapped or if they have been tapped, they have not been tapped in the proper sense, in the ideal sense, in, the, in, 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 in a better way so as to bring Amen in the existing situation. Uh, just now before discussing with uh, Dick, I was planning to uh, see what how to begin the things and I just scrolled the, uh, my uh, laptop and I saw the news that uh, the United Nations, uh, this, is, this is the uh, heading and that is by ABC News and this is a uh, news reportage of one or, or, or before. The United Nations remains deadlocked on Israel-Gaza ceasefire vote despite mounting calls. And when we open, I open that uh, news report. The president of uh, uh, Israel, Isaac Herzog, was saying, we are not fighting the people of Gaza. We are fighting Hamas. And the number of people who have, there is this another, uh, uh, just the report of one day earlier by uh, the Guardian, and that says that, it underlines that Palestinian death toll in Gaza nears 20,000, with 2 million people displaced. So these are the current existing realities. 
and uh, the other thing the united nations failed despite the fact that and i'll just now tell you how uh, things are actually uh, similar the way things happened in the past the period which we say the period of barbarism the pe period which we say uh, as the period of uh, darkness the period which we say as the as as the period uh, before enlightenment uh, and now we are in uh, the a period of enlightenment we are in the period of development we are in the period of uh, secularization and all things the the the, the all the paraphernalia paraphernalia of modernity uh, so but here is another important news which is reported by uh, al jazeera and it says that is one hour before and that says that hamas leader Ismail Haniyeh is uh, in Egypt for uh, Gaza talk. He, he actually, the leader of Hamas has gone to Egypt for talk, for discussion, for that long. So here comes this idea of a mechanism, uh, the idea of a side, the idea of uh, a way through which these existing moment of uh, despair, we can. Uh, 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 try to build upon uh, the, the aspect with which we can we can do things in order to build upon the sites which are available to us. So, what I'll do is I will recount two conversations. One of the conversation is of fourth uh, century BC. That is the termed as the Malian dialogue. And the other is the recent discussion in the United Nations General Assembly uh, when it was voting for humanitarian ceasefire in the in, in uh, Israel Hamas. I'll not say war, Israeli aggression. So the similarity between the discussion in these two, uh, you can say. Uh, a platform, you can say uh, the accounting of the fact, so different in time and circumstances, but the similarity between the manner in which the parties are talking. So let's try to put things to perspective. Uh, in around, you all might be aware that there was a lot of war going on during earlier time at the time, uh, the time of uh, Greek city estates between the smaller city estates. There were two city estates. Uh, the, there were many city estates, but uh, there was the fight between Athens and Sparta. And Sparta's subsidiary, Sparta's uh, 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 subsidiary, you can say, or uh, another smaller state which was in alliance with that. So the military general of Athens, went in to invade the city state of Melos. And there is this conversation between the military general of the, the, the Athenian, Athenian military general and the Melian military general. And the discussion which they had, you will find the resonance of that in the discussion in United Nations few weeks, few weeks last week. And it's still, after the resounding uh, support in General Assembly, one, I think, 153 uh, by 20, I think. So I have the exact details. It is 153. Uh, yeah, it's 153 in favor and 10 against. So after this, uh, uh, the, the, the passage of uh, the, uh, for the humanitarian pause in General Assembly is still the Security Council has halted, which uh, uh, ideally should have come on Monday, but it's still uh, one hour before I looked and then I saw that it's still uh, United States of America has halted the, the final uh, uh, take on that by the United, Nation, uh, United uh, Nations Security Council. So that is spe specifically being halted by uh, United States. So uh, let's first see the dialogue between these two uh, military generals uh, during the time of uh, the Athenian civil uh, the civil war the the 
go between the city estates in um, the, the the war between the city estates and in Greece, Greek city estate. Let's actually quote uh, the words in their own terms. So the, I hope the context is clear. This is the dialogue. It is termed as dialogue. Actually, it's not dialogue, and we will see why it is not dialogue and what is the discussion difference between dialogue and uh, uh, negotiation and discussion and debate that we'll see later. But then, for all practical purposes, it is termed as million dialogue. If you will type, it will come by million dialogue. And it has been uh, written by uh, in the history of the Peloponnesian War uh, by the erudite historian. Uh, so, the military general of Athens, after reaching the island of Melos, the city state of Melos, the Athenian general says, It is quote, Then on our side, we will use no fine phrase saying, for example, that we have a right to our empire because we defeated the Persians. You know, um, for perspective, there was a fight between the uh, Greece and Persia, that is the famous fight. You know as well as we do that when these matters are discussed by practical people, the standard of justice depends on the equality of power to compel and that in fact the strong do what they have the power to do and the weak accept what they have to accept. This is by the strong party to the war, I love the conflict, to the war and the military general of the strong party is saying this to the military general of or the military of the uh, weaker party, uh, the millions, the millos. Then the million military general responds, you should not destroy, for those of uh, us who are from international relations background, this will be clear to too. I can see Sukana here. So she will be in the know of this and others. But then for those from, because I came to know from Bezad that uh, there are uh, participants from different backgrounds. So uh, uh, for that, I am actually discussing this in detail. Otherwise, the cursory mention of this would have done. So the response of the uh, Athenian military general was, this is no fair fight with honor on one side and shame on the other. It is rather a question of saving your lives and not resisting those who are far too strong for you. Then the Malians, uh, uh, sorry, it, I actually uh, uh, came for the Athenians. The Malians said that you should not destroy a principle that is to the general good of all men. Namely that in the case of all who fail into danger, who fall into danger, there should be such a thing as fair play and just dealing. You can find the resonance of this in the plea of the Palestinian ambassador to the United Nations and all others. So Malians say you should not destroy a principle that is to the general good of all men. See this as humanitarian pause, call for humanitarian pause. Namely that in the case of all who fall into danger, there should be such a thing as fair play and just dealing. Emphasize, uh, bear in mind these words, fair play, and just dealing. And how the Athenian military general has been responded to, the, sorry, the Millennium, uh, million military general has been responded to by the Athenians. This he's saying, Athenian military general is saying, this is no fair fight with honor on one side and shame on the other. It is rather a question of saving your lives and not resisting those who are far too strong for you. The Malian military general again reply, it is difficult for us to oppose your power and fortune and for, uh, 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 oppose your power and fortune. Nevertheless, we trust that the gods will give us fortune as good as yours. I hope you are able to find the resonance with the things which is happening between Gaza and uh, Israel. The representatives there in the United Nations. Then the Athenian military general again responds, our opinion of the gods and our knowledge of men lead us to conclude that it is a general and necessary law of nature to rule whatever one can. 
This is not a law that we made ourselves, nor were we the first to act upon it when it was met. We found it already in existence and we shall leave it to exist forever among those who come after us. We are merely acting in accordance with it and we know that you or anybody else with the same power as us would be acting in precisely the same way. You seem to forget that if one follows one's self-interest, one wants to be safe, whereas the path of justice and honor involves one in danger. This is this safe rule to stand up to one's equals, to behave with defense to one's superior, and to treat one's inferior with moderation. This is the response of, this is the uh, a proclamation of the Athenian military general. And then the millions again respond. The million military general again tries to fall back to the fair principle and justice idea. And he says, our decision, Athenian, is just the same as it was. At first, we are not prepared to give up in a short moment the liberty which our city has enjoyed from its foundation for 700 years. And then Athenians respond, imbued in the in the uh, in the arrogance of power, which we are seeing now also. You seem to us to see uncertainties as realities simply because you would like them to be so. So this I quoted from the Melian dialogue, uh, which is depicting the interaction between military general of two in a world like situation. Just contrast this with what transpired in United Nations uh, meeting, uh, I'll not say Security Council and General Assembly separately, but, but once. So it is for bringing humanitarian pause, humanitarian ceasefire in the war between Israel and Hamas. Palestinian, I'll say. The Palestinian in war, so this is uh, as a result of the call, which was first uh, uh, there in the United uh, United Nations uh, Secretary General in book uh, Article 99, and as a result of that, there was uh, uh, an emergency, me emergency meeting of the United Nations Security Council in that 13 to 2 it was passed, and then subsequent to that, there was this meeting of the United Nations General Assembly. In that it was passed uh, 153 to 10. So the Palestinian envoy to the United Nations, he implores, he implored member states to vote to end the Israeli bombardment of the Gaza Strip and to increase aid deliveries to the 2.3 million Palestinians living in the besieged territory. See his words. I appeal to all of you to vote to stop the killing. Vote for humanitarian aid. Contrast it with what the fair principle, the million military general was invoking. Vote for humanitarian aid to reach those whose very survival depends on it. Vote to stop this madness. How can representative of a state explain how horrible it is that 1,000 Israelis were killed and not feel the same outrage when 1,000 Palestinians are now killed every single day? Why not feel a sense of urgency to end their killing? And then how it has been responded to by Gilad Erdan, who is the representative of Israel. And he says, Hamas attack as a pogrom, the rockets were only cover for the pogrom that followed. A barbaric Hamas terrorist invaded Israel from the sea, the land, and the air. They came with one purpose to salvage, to savagely murder every living thing they encounter and in on 12th december december uh, in the voting israel's permanent uh, representative again said that it is a vote about another hypocritical resolution the resolution for saving life is being termed as another hypocritical resolution not only does this resolution fail to condemn Hamas for crimes against humanity, it does not mention Hamas at all. This will only prolong the death and destruction in the region. That is precisely what a ceasefire means. He added 
that the only intention of Hamas is to destroy Israel, and that's the group has declared that it will repeat its atrocities again and again until Israel ceases to exist. So why would one want to aid Hamas in continuing the rule of terror and actualizing their satanic agenda? We all know that so that the so-called humanitarian ceasefire. This is a humanitarian ceasefire, but it is being termed as is being responded to as. Like this, in these words, we all know that the so-called humanitarian ceasefire in this resolution has nothing to do with humanity. Israel is already taking every measure to facilitate the entry of humanitarian aid into Gaza, and the whole world is saying this. So hypocrisy is where the whole world is saying this, but this is how it is being responded to by the representative and a deliberative body, that is the highest deliberative body, that is the United Nations. And then, again, uh, uh, doing away with all forms of civility and other things, the uh, ambassador goes on to say that the ceasefire means only one thing, and that is the survival of Hamas. I honestly don't know, he says, how can someone look into the mirror and support a resolution that does not condemn Hamas and does not even mention Hamas their name? He said, well, I think the members is just not to vote. This at a time when everyone is seeing the because of the lack of oxygen in uh, the pediatric ward of the hospitals in Gaza, uh, newly born and premature babies are dying, and their uh, bodies have been found in uh, uh, in a very uh, problematic state. So this is the reality, and in this reality, we have to talk about forging peace, building peace understanding dialogue, reconciliation, and peace. So at the face of it, it seems that uh, these are the things because nothing has changed. You can find, we, we, we just now saw so much of uh, similarity between the way things were there during uh, 4th century BC and seeing now in 2000. So things seems to not have changed much. The same barbarity, the same uh, 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 not taking account of the uh, of the the pleas of the other, and then arrogating oneself to the to the uh, whims of power, going on to do whatever the powerful wants to do. Here comes the idea of some scholars who I uh, very often. Uh, quote in our classes too. And here comes the idea of a scholars like Gramsci, who says that we need not put ourselves under the, the garb of the existing realities in such a manner that the intellectual understanding of us lead us not to see of any home. And here he talks about in terms of a strategy, so strategizing, which we will see in terms of strategizing for peace, and what uh, uh, Antonio Gramsci talks in terms of uh, uh, the things which was happening during his time. In time. Yeah, um, by the way, the capitalist hegemon hegemonization was continuing, and what the workers could do during that time, the proletariat could do that time. So invoking Gramsci here, what uh, in the times which we have now, I'll do is we will try to explore these possibilities of peace. And we'll try to see that where dialogue, reconciliation, and religion fits into it. How religion, dialogue, reconciliation, these things can be utilized. These are the sites which can be utilized in the manner of Gramscian idea of capitalizing on the optimism of the will. These sites could be utilized to forge peace and be hopeful. Okay. So Again, coming back to the uh, reportages, two reportages, we, we discussed the uh, reluctance of, uh, I'll not say United Nations, but the powerful countries of the United Nations, or the single most powerful country of the most preponderant power of the world, United Nations, in, in coming up with uh, or delaying a resolution. And the same time, there is the reportage of the leader of one of the parties who's traveling to a different place to undertake a talk, a talk to hold a talk in order to 
bring uh, some sort of mitigation to the existing situation. So again, uh, invoking Gramsci, what Gramsci says is that there are ways through which we can strategize to work in for bringing hope. And this could be done by a judicious mix of optimism of the will with the pessimism of the intellect. So the pessimism of the intellect may impel us, may uh, tell us that actually things are not going to be of any better because whatever we are seeing now that, is, that has been happening since maybe time immemorial and we have this example of the Amelian Dialogue and the United Nations, the dysfunctionality of the United Nations. But then this needs to be substantiated with the idea of the optimism of the will. And that optimism of the will leads us to explore the sites where we can make use of the existing situation to bring amen in the existing problematic situation. I hope, uh, by the way, uh, your pensive faces I'm seeing, I hope it's okay, I'm able to make sense. Uh, I have, uh, I'm not sure only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, uh, I should uh, leave Muzammar because he's moderator. Only two to four to six, to, only eight uh, people are continuing or is it that uh, in this session, uh, less number of you are stand up? Yes, Alia, uh, Naim, Sonal, Zikra, uh, Tolika, Munir, Sayada. Uh, does it make sense? I hope you are uh, uh, with me in uh, the session till now. I hope it's okay. So either yes or no, you can just, uh, through your faces, you can just just uh, yes, it's okay or not okay. Yes, Tolika, Munir, Mr. Munir. Okay, so let me make it more interactive because I, I used to, I was uh, speaking for most of the time. So let me ask you. So uh, uh, before coming to your uh, lecture, I just uh, very quickly glanced the other uh, lectures which you had uh, gone through. So by now you are midway through this session, I think, and you, I think you know more about uh, the theoretical aspects and the basics of dialogue and other things. So on the understanding of yours from your past lectures, uh, what do you think? Uh, do you think that dialogue could be a mechanism, given the realities which we just now saw? Could dialogue be a process, a way, a mechanism, a means to bring amend in the existing, uh, or it is just a delaying tactics, or just a utopian view, or just a, a, a way of just theoretically seeing things and with no practical usage? What do you think? And I, I, I hope you will be honest in your uh, uh, answers. So any one of you? How many of you think that, so of course it should not be like this that you are uh, doing a course in dialogue study. So you have to, you have to come up with convincing argument in support of your view. So if you may ask any one of you, if any uh, one of you want to volunteer to say, so do you think that dialogue could be a means and mechanism to bring amendment to existing problematic situation? Kaina is, I guess, she wants to say so, something. Yes, yeah, so, uh, yeah, yeah, please. So Kaina, can you please go ahead? Yes, okay, Kaina, yeah. Uh, yes, sir, according to me, when, it, like, when you talk about dialogue, dialogue only works if it is uh, in a place where uh, the, there is a, uh, equal distribution of power or where both the parties are more or less in the same position to dialogue. But I think when it comes to unequal distribution of power, especially when we talk about international. Yeah, I, so dialogue I, works when there is this, uh, some sort of parity in power. Okay. Yeah. So when there's such a mismatch, it won't work. Okay, good. Very good. Uh, so before further going, Further, I'll uh, discuss dialogue in detail and the definition of dialogue by the critical understanding of the law, and that will make things more clear. Uh, yes, others? Yeah, Mr. Munir, if I may ask you. Or uh, Naeem, or Sonal, or Alia, or Trilika, or Zikra. So this is how we, uh, by the way, how many of you have gone through the uh, readings which I have uh, sent? Is there... Okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's perfectly well. 
uh, if you have not gone through the reading, it's perfectly okay. But then, uh, from what you could uh, make sense of uh, uh, dialogue, uh, just uh, very quickly uh, tell me what's your view? What do you think? You all know what dialogue is. You have uh, continued with two, three, four, five lectures earlier, two, three at least. So, uh, on the basis of that, uh, could you uh, say or uh, something pertaining to what and how dialogue could be a means or if at all dialogue could be a means in a situation like this? Then we are seeing the uh, deliberative, the uh, uh, the problematic deliberations which are happening in the highest citadel of the place where dialogue takes place. Is uh, so can I say that uh, there is so much of mismatch between part? It is. You can write also if you want. You can write if you don't want to. Tulika has her hand up. I guess she can. Uh, uh, yes, you Tulika. can unmute and speak, Tulika. Yeah. Yes, Hello, sir. Uh, so, so as your previous question about uh, if dialogue would work in the current scenario, right? So to be very honest, before joining this course, I was quite radical about this. I always used to say that this is not going to make any sense. I had a conversation with Behzad, sir, too. So... <laughs> I I was quite skeptical when it comes to religion religion and stuff. Then I usually prefer to not have a comment uh, about it because obviously everyone's belief uh, beliefs are subjective. But then yeah, after like few uh, classes, uh, a lot of things in my mind did change. That that basically how uh, we do this, like how this dialogue uh, form of conversation, basically it. Could, it uh, it might help in bringing uh, the real peace and all the stuff that would moderate the situation. Could I think it might work out? Good. So uh, as a result of attending this uh, dialogue sessions, now you think that yes, it could be uh, a site. It could be a mechanism and means to at least uh, bring some changes, if not. Uh, uh, that uh, radically positive way of thinking it to be the panacea. So good. Uh, others? What about others? Is there someone who think that no, uh, it's just a, a utopian thing and dialogue is just for the sake good for the sake of uh, theoretical discussion, but at, in actual practice, it uh, may not be of uh, much value. Is there anyone who believe like this? No, at least... Uh, Hi, Tehseen. This is Alia. Uh, hello. Yes, Alia. Yeah. yeah, I am the alumni coordinator here. I'm not one of the participants, but I work within Dialogue Foundation. And uh, I feel that, um, yes, dialogue is very helpful. But if you have those expectations, like, you know, I can solve the Palestinian, uh, you know, problems with dialogue, it might not be true. It could be really a far far-fetched dream. But I feel that if you uh, start dialogue thinking that, you know, you're going to get somewhere, not not have really high expectations, but, you know, you want to bring about a positive change, then you can. But uh, with lo lofty expectations, you just fall down with a thud. That's what I feel about dialogue, that it can be really useful if you don't uh, have too many expectations attached to it. You can bring about a change, you know, some change in your, uh, in your, uh, in the other party's hearts or whatever. But you might not always achieve what you go on to achieve, you what you want to. That's what I feel about it. So it's very useful. Okay, good. Uh, good yeah, idea. but it has. Yeah. That's how uh, uh, when we go into the details of uh, dialogue, then we will see that uh, it is actually like this because. Dialogue is something which is, must not be looked with uh, certain aims in mind. Dialogue is the beginning of the things. Dialogue is uh, making us aware of the different possibilities. So if uh, we intend to achieve something, if something is in our mind and we want to achieve that, so that may not ideally be a dialogic process, which we will just now see when we'll go through the uh, uh, details of the different scholars. So uh, next on uh, uh, the uh, 
uh, way in which I want to proceed is to first understand the uh, potential of dialogue or the theoretical understanding of dialogue. And then if uh, for someone who has gone through the study material, which I have sent, there is this uh, uh, Saunders idea of sustained dialogue, the sustained dialogue initiative. And in that sustained dialogue initiative, Saunders and others have actually uh, 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 empirically uh, proved that uh, through a process, how things could uh, begin to change. And uh, he and others have given a lot of example in that, and that is there in that. Uh, for those of you who want to further study, you can go through the study material. So uh, what now I uh, intend to do very quickly is to understand what uh, the uh, potential of dialogue is and where does religion come? So uh, religion also becomes a side. So what actually religion is, I'm not going into the details of that. It's not uh, very, uh, because as I can see, the uh, the uh, background of the participants, uh, most of them are not, uh, yeah, uh, this is a mixed background, participants are there, so it need not be very academic. So uh, what I'll do is uh, just uh, very quickly see uh, the take of dialogue by different and how the uh, interdisciplinary approach of dialogue. So the scholars from different fields, so communications theory or from theology or from uh, anthropology, political science, even sciences in physics, David Blom is there. So how these scholars from diverse fields are underlining the importance of uh, dialogue. There is a very good book and the name of that book is The Magic of Dialogue that is written in the, uh, the American context. And in that context, dialogue actually has been understood to be the sine qua non for uh, bringing any chain. So to set the ball rolling, to not uh, uh, bring things to a, a dead end, uh, dialogue is should be there. And it's not that dialogue should only be there in terms when uh, at the international level, when there is a situation of war. But this dialogic mechanism actually is something which works at all levels, even at the level of the classes, even at the level of uh, uh, the society, even at the level of the families. So why so much focus on uh, dialogue? Why are we focusing on dialogue? Why, for, why dialogue is important? So focusing our attention on the uh, this study of or this understanding of dialogue uh, will actually give us a way or will actually try to uh, build uh, 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 or, or, or will give us a mechanism to or a momentum to build for uh, practicalizing this or putting this into practice as well as the uh, development of the utilization of uh, uh, dialogue for bringing amen in a situation which seems to have uh, reached a dead end where nothing can happen. So dialogue emphasizing and studying dialogue will actually enable us to be hopeful. It will give us uh, uh, a sort of some idea or uh, a sort of a mechanism or a process in our hand to begin the process, to keep moving ahead, to not reach a dead end. So the study of dialogue would uh, seem to have a natural place in a society uh, which is oriented towards peace and which is oriented towards resolving the conflict or solving the problem in a manner in which it is for good for all and not just for the good of those who are the most powerful or who are at a higher pedestal or who are, who are, at a, at a, who are better off or who are uh, more better placed. So it's in fact will contribute a uh, dialogue mechanism, dialogue process will contribute a significant way to nurturing that orientation and creating that society, which is more peaceful, where the idea of peace could be had, or this the, the idea of uh, uh, having um, um, uh, uh, or, or the idea of solving problem in a manner in which it is somewhat uh, not siding more towards the powerful, or it's 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 not uh, uh, actually being a party to or or victimizing the victim more. So that actually is the potential of dialogue. So before we formally uh, try to understand the different scholars, let us first try to have a working definition of dialogue and, and try to see what dialogue, what we mean by dialogue. 
so we may understand dialogue to consist of meaningful interaction and exchange between people who come together through various kinds of conversations or activities with a view to increased understanding so dialogue actually is different from negotiation or dialogue is different from debate or discussion or declamation in dialogue the purpose is the increased understanding of the thing and when the increased understanding of the things happen then that is the site that is the place where from the proceed towards the solution arises or we can proceed towards any sort of solutions or moving ahead so dialogue the the, the most important thing about dialogue is that it 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 elicits it it uh, uh, puts to the of uh, it it puts to light the importance of understanding each side of the conflict or each side of the problem or each parties the idea of each parties okay so dialogue uh, for our purpose will mean to consist of uh, the following stages which has been outlined by uh, uh, different scholars and that processes could be like it has been divided into four different aspects so for for example to begin with dialogue begins when people meet each other so how actually uh, the process of dialogue of course dialogue can only begin when there is the meeting of different people so the beginning of dialogue dialogue begins when people meet each other meeting doesn't do anything meeting doesn't solve any problem but meeting is the beginning and the beginning in itself is a great achievement so the deadlock of course you all are right that dialogue is not going to solve the problem finally maybe but then at least we are able to the palestinian and the israelis will be able to understand the plight of the others okay so that beginning is the dialogue is the platform which provides that beginning then dialogue depends on mutual understanding and mutual trust so the point which has been highlighted by uh, sukana earlier that so if nobody is ready to understand the other side there is no respect for the other's view there is utter disregard of the other then in that situation dialogue may not work so the dialogue to work properly what needs to be there as an ingredient as a uh, existing exist okay good so the third part is that dialogue make it possible to share in service to the community so the community could be yeah it's not just that uh, the level could be international the level could be uh, uh, local the level could be intermediary any level could be there but it actually dialogue provides the possibility to share in the service to the different communities the places or the people or the group or the countries or the state we are uh, uh, in discussion with and finally dialogue becomes the medium of dialogue becomes the medium of authentic witness so being a part of the process itself is a very learning exercise in order for in order to reach any conclusion being a part being a part in the process of that dialogue is itself a very learning exercise and uh with this brief idea of the working definition of dialogue let's now very quickly see the different scholars how how they have uh, defined dialogue and what they mean with dialogue so name is writing yes you written it now uh, according to me dialogue is one of the best mechanism and intermediary to reduce misunderstandings and conflict of everything however it is often primarily employed during conflicts when everything is okay dialogue may not seem necessary however in the case of afghanistan i believe it has failed to solve any problem over the past three decades uh, so uh, mr name you are from afghanistan go oh, yes yes you are right and that actually is the thing which different scholars also highlight that we tend to make use of the potential of dialogue only when we have reached a dead end so for dialogue to be very useful it needs to be utilized it needs to be resorted to it needs to be understood it needs to be 
uh, uh, taken into account if in ordinary situations too and not just in warlike situation. But the good thing about dialogue is that even in a warlike situation, this is the ground, this is the platform, this is the place, this is the, uh, this is the beginning. So in that sense too, even when the violence has actually, uh, the outbreak of violence has taken place, even then dialogue remains the only mechanism. Yes, if dialogue remains a successful mechanism or, or not, this is debated. But yes, it is a mechanism and it's a useful mechanism. So uh, let's now very quickly see the definition of dialogue by different scholars who are working in the field of uh, dialogue. Uh, these scholars are from different fields, from religious studies, uh, from interfaith dialogue studies, from philosophy, social theory to communication studies, public opinion analysis, and even quantum physics. There is a scholar uh, whose name is Martin Buber, is a philosopher. And Martin Buber underlines that dialogue is the mode of interaction which makes any human life in any society worth living. It's a big claim. Martin Weber says that dialogues enables us to be called as civilized being. It's, it's, it's uh, maybe for those, yeah, message posted here and dedicated, no, nothing. I thought that someone of you has messaged me. So uh, Martin Buber uh, underlines that dialogue is that mode of interaction which makes any human life in any society worth living. Then th there is this uh, other scholar I was just now mentioning about uh, the magic of dialogue. This is the book which is written by the name of the scholar is Daniel Yankelovich. Daniel Yankelovich underlines the importance of dialogue in societies. In, in uh, uh, the work of Daniel Yankelovich is uh, there in the United States of America, and. Uh, the proliferation of dialogue initiative in the United States, the scholar says, reflects the existential condition of the modern America, which yearns for connection and mutual understanding in the face of the isolation accompanying trends of technological advancement, globalization, and individualism. This scholar highlight the fact that uh, given the preponderance of or uh, the uh, uh, the uh, onward march of onward onslaught of individualism, globalization, and technological advancement. In in this situation, dialogue provides a mechanism where the goodness of the civilizational understanding or the human potential could be uh, brought into focus. He's again is making a very strong claim, a very big claim, and there are other scholars who also highlight the importance of dialogue. There are scholars like, uh, uh, I have talked about Martin Wilbur, and there are scholars like uh, 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 David Bohm. David Bohm is uh, from the science background. And for David Bohm, dialogue is essentially a process of sheer thinking in the course of which a valuable form of relationship might emerge. So what dialogue, according to David Bohm, is it is actually a process of sheer thinking. And in the process of sheer thinking, there is no uh, prior intention, there is no prior idea, there is no prior end. But then in the course of that sheer thinking, there is the possibility of the development of uh, a relationship which will enable the uh, solution of the problem or if it is not a problem, then the uh, taking up the issue from the multifaceted ways in which it could be approached. Uh, at the same time, Buber, Martin Buber, who said that dialogue makes us essentially a civilized being. The idea of dialogue, the fact that we are able to make use of dialogue makes us a civilized be uh, being. For Buber, dialogue is essentially a relationship though it generally encompasses a cognitive grasp of the other's point of view. So it's both, there are scholars who say that dialogue is the process and there are scholars who say that dialogue is sort of a relationship. Okay. 
So then there is our other scholars from the uh, yeah, interfaith studies, intercultural dialogue studies. Uh, there is a scholar whose name is uh, uh, O'Neill Baum. We discussed just now Armstrong and Nasser. So the cons uh, then there is this co concept of dialogue by uh, Gulen. Uh, uh, the organization we are just we are now having discussion in. So this concept of dialogue, which envisages dialogue as a meaningful interaction and exchange between people that has actually already been discussed, that has been uh, highlighted by uh, Petula Golan, through different kinds of conversation and activities with a view to increase understanding of things. Then there are other scholars like uh, Donald Karbauch, and Donald Karbauch highlights the uh, uniqueness of dialogue in the fact that the, the findings uh, of uh, scholars like uh, Donald Karbach highlights the perspective of dialogue from the point of view of the understanding from the point of view of the other people involved in the party. So the findings of these scholars highlight that the, uh, the dialogue actually is a mechanism, dialogue actually is a tool, dialogue actually is a site which provides us spaces wherefore the idea of hope can continue. And how that dialogue is actually being utilized in order to promote the idea of, for example, interfaith understanding, or for example, the interstate dialogue, or for example, citizenship diplomacy, how actually it is being practiced. There are another set of scholars who, are, who try to uh, 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 explain this. Uh, then there is not just this positive aspect of uh, uh, dialogue. There are scholars like uh, Jürgen Habermas, whose idea of uh, dialogue has been very, uh, uh, I'll say, brutally criticized by scholars like Foucault, uh, because Jürgen Habermas examines the model of rational, transparent, and courteous communication. And uh, it has been criticized by Foucault that the dialogue actually is not happening in an ideal space. The dialogue actually is happening in a power relationship. So everything essentially is working in a power relationship. So to think of dialogue as something which is rational, which is transparent, and which is a part of the courteous communication, that actually is just missing the frame in which dialogue actually is working. So everything is working in this notion of uh, hierarchy, hierarchized power. So within that frame, things are actually going on, things actually are working. And therefore, to understand dialogue as something which uh, uh, inculcates or which promotes rational or transparent or courteous communication is too much to expect from dialogue. Then there are this view of uh, scholars like Sayyid Hassan uh, Hussain Dasir. His view of dialogue is in the context of interfaith dialogue. And uh, scholars like uh, Nasser highlights the similarity and the importance of dialogue in the different religious tradition. So there is this idea of common spiritual ground between different religious traditions. And uh, the different religious traditions actually highlight the, uh, the, the, the importance of dialogue from the point of view of the essential unity of mankind. So for example, recently uh, in the Israel-Palestine issue, uh, we had this famous uh, speech by Netanyahu in which he said that uh, the Palestinians are actually the children of Amalek, the children of uh, the bad uh, or the, the children of the darkness. So the children of the, uh, Amalek is the invocation of the idea of religion. So scholars like uh, Nasser says that this has... The, the, the religion actually provides the potential to be utilized in different ways. What the power dynamics does in Foucauldian tradition, what power di dynamics does, only that aspect of religion is highlighted or that asp uh, aspect of religion is used as, for example, the uh, Israeli defense forces or uh, Israel is actually utilizing these days, is only that aspect which is of use to them in order for their, the promotion of their ideas or the perpetuation of their power politics. The other aspect of religion, the compassionate aspect of religion, the essential unity of humankind, uh, uh, and other notions of uh, particularly the Abrahamic religion, which is 
they are in conflict in uh, a, 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 a place like uh, uh, Israel and Palestine. So that aspect of religion is not highlighted. And it is where comes uh, the idea of the ambivalence of the sacred. The ambivalence of the sac sacred, uh, this has been highlighted by many scholars, for example, a scholar called Paul Appleby. There are scholars like Mark Gopin. I have shared the details of uh, their writing with you. So scholars like uh, Paul Appleby and Mark Gopin, they highlight the fact that despite the fact that we had a lot of expectations from the secularization theory, but of late, the use of religion in politics is increasing a lot. So religion actually, if uh, we want to see it from the perspective of the uh, current war which is happening in which there has been a lot of use of religious symbols, there has been a, 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 large, a lot of invocation of religious ideas, both from the side of the uh, Palestine and uh, uh, Israel. So scholars like this highlight the fact that religion's ambivalence is linked to the fact that all around the world, the relationship of religions to violence and conflict is unclear and it can be expressed in different ways. So what actually we are highlighting, that matters a lot. And there seems to uh, uh, exist an inconsistency of religion to conflict, which is made clear when religious involvement in political violence in sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and other parts of the world is seen. So again, I've uh, shared with you the writing of scholars like uh, Haynes, and Haynes and others have uh, uh, actually undertook a study of uh, uh, the utilization of religious symbols in different places and how the same notion which is present in the same idea which is present in religion that has actually been utilized ambivalently by both the forces of the opposing sides. Okay, So that actually is the place we need to emphasize upon and utilize the, uh, the uniting potential of uh, religion. And there has been a lot of uh, uh, faith-based and other groups which are actually working uh, all over the world. Uh, that uh, uh, I have shared with you in the uh, detailed uh, detailed form in the form of your readings. There is another uh, someone has message according to me. Dialogue is okay. This is the earlier. I'm not sure why it is popping up again and again. So I'm getting distracted a bit. So the ambivalence of the sacred needs to be understood as a site where from the idea of the utilization of religion towards building peace, towards reconciliation, that could be understood, that could be, uh, that could be uh, utilized, that could be positively taken account of. So uh, to summarize these things about how uh, religion uh, could be made use of and how dialogue could be uh, utilized in terms of bringing different religions together. So for example, uh, those of us who think that religion is the problem, or religion actually is the uh, cause of conflict, uh, particularly in the Middle Eastern, uh, uh, Middle Eastern region. So what if we see the pre-1940, uh, you can say, or the pre-1920s, uh, you can say, there has been this, all these faiths, the Abrahamic religion were living peacefully. There have been some sort of uh, uh, turmoil and conflict, but that used to uh, be solved within the ambit of that particular uh, setting that need not arise to that level which would incur uh, such sort of uh, gigantic uh, proportion. But as a result of the utilization of a particular aspect of religion by the different parties and that being allowed by the other people and of course by the secularists, that actually is the reason for the religion to be utilized in a in a in a in a different way. So Mark Gopin in his work has highlighted how the different faith-based groups are actually working and utilizing the the compassionate potential of religion in order to bring peace in the conflict-ridden society. There have been works in 
uh, you know, African countries too. A lot of people have worked on Africa and how the different religious groups have actually utilized the potential of religion through dialogic mechanism. And the whole process of interfaith dialogue has been established. And that actually, if not working wonders, at least providing a space in order to bring some sort of amen in the problematic uh, situations in the world. So uh, to summarize all these things, there are the uh, uh, religious people or religious leaders, they have got this opportunity to utilize the, 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 uh, the positive potential of religion in a way which could help them mitigate the conflict. So the faith-based people are actually uniquely positioned to foster non-violent conflict transformation through the building of constructive collaborative relationship within and across ethnic and religious groups for the common good of the entire population. And it is here that they may utilize the potential which is provided by the mechanism or the process of dialogue. In uh, many countries of the world, which are which comes under the category of protracted conflict, which is conflict which is continuing since long. This aspect has not been, this uh, dialogic aspect in the real sense of the term has not been given much attention. And that is the reason that they are still persisting, they are, they are still continuing. So the problem lies somewhere else, and we are not able to understand that problem because of the lack of the dialogic, dialogic mechanism. Through dialogic mechanism, we may be able to understand the real place, the real site, which gives rise to the problem. So maybe if we will not be able to understand the problem in the real sense of the term, where actually it is emerging from, then of course the medicine which is prescribed, that won't be wrong, that, that would be wrong. So if you have a lot of expectation, for example, from the Oslo Accord, or for example, such sort of uh, high decibel uh, inter-estate uh, uh, dialogic mechanism done by the people, uh, from the formal mechanism only, from the formal side only, and not taken into, are not taking into account the citizens' initiative, the people. So that actually will not lead to be a viable solution uh, in the long run. So for any solution to be in the long run, to be useful, to be uh, of help, it is important that the different parties through dialogic mechanism should be taken account of. So uh, the in the many conflicts of the world, the problem is that the social location and the cultural power of religion actually because of our imbuedness in the secular tradition and the secularizing secularization theory, we are not able to creatively utilize the potential of religion. And that is the reason that the efforts to build peace in those areas proved to be short-lived. If at all, peace seems to have come, that doesn't remain there for long. It actually uh, doesn't carry the weight for long. So it is important for, in the words of uh, scholars like uh, Appleby again, that this humanizing, this uniting, this positive potential of the uh, mechanism of, for example, uh, reconciliation in the different religions. So reconciliation mechanism is there in most of the religions of the world. Uh, actually, the idea of reconciliation has come from biblical tradition only. So in Islam, in Judaism, in Christianity, everywhere, this idea of reconciliation is there and that needs to be, because if there is punitive judgment, if things happen as a result of uh, uh, the dictates of those who are at the helm of affair, or as a result of the proclamations of the things, so that may not prove to be a long lasting solution. So if only, the different stakeholders are actually involved in a dialogic aspect, only then the solution or the end which is agreed upon by all will prove to be a long-lasting solution. So uh, I think uh, mm, uh, I should stop here. If I, I, I hope it made, uh, it made some sense. There is this uh, another reading pertaining to sustain dialogue initiative. That is a very important thing. But if I have not, I don't want to test your patience. Uh, but if you give me five, 10 minutes more, we will uh, very quickly try to understand that sustained dialogue initiative. That's very important. That's by all sounders. And that actually, very quickly, just I'll, I'll summarize. Uh, if it is okay, I hope you are able, I'm able to convey uh, 
is it that this discussion seem to be uh, connected in some sense or religion reconciliation peace it is more did, did it make sense no it it does sir it's very thought provoking and intellectually stimulating so yeah i guess we'll have because more questions we so, ourselves i myself to be very honest we are we have actually had our studies in a very uh, post enlightenment tradition and now whatever i am saying and bringing religion in into this it apparently seems to be quite polemic but then this is the actual reality so in the very in the initial caveat which i uh, uh, expressed in the beginning i said that it's not going to be very academic it is in line with the existing reality reality of the world the world which we are seeing that when we are talking we are discussing in one hour i am unfortunately uh, i'm very sad to say that more than uh, 100 200 israel uh, uh, palestine gazans would have been killed during the time when we are discussing these things now so in that situation we are discussing things and talking about peace so uh, it takes a lot of effort to make things uh, for myself to for, for, for myself to understand thing it, it is it is quite uh, not in the usual way uh, so what we need to do is this uh, idea of bringing in a dialogic mechanism that cannot be left that cannot be we, we cannot afford to leave it this is the only thing this is the only uh, uh, this is the last resort this is the last or the final thing in uh, our hand so if you have to so till the time we are talking we are till the time we are discussing till the time we are interacting we are not killing so if killing if talking is stopped if discussion is stopped if dialogue is stopped then that leads to kill so in that sense uh, today's discussion is and uh, very quickly i'll try to uh, because i have sent to the reading to of sustain dialogue initiative so very quickly i will uh, try to uh, summarize that sustain dialogue initiative uh, in conflict resolution and peace building so how through sustain dialogue uh, this uh, uh, this has actually been practiced by uh, scholars at different level at uh, our school level at uh, uh, international level and at the level of the community so what they do in in sustained dialogue initiative is in sustained uh, dialogue initiative the scholars have identified sustained dialogue means and that is by uh, the idea by saunders uh, saunders actually highlights the fact that uh, dialogue actually is a sort of relationship and during the course of the dialogue there are multiple things which emerges and that in itself leads to the process of reaching to the minds of the different parties involved and there are different mechanism which is highlighted here there are five components of uh, the sustain dialogue initiative and those five components of and the term is it as the sustain dialogue uh, uh, five components of relationship so they talk in terms of relationship so those five components of relationship are identity interest power perception misperception and stereotypes so this this through this process what actually happens that the perception and misperception one has that actually gets cleared one begins to understand the idea of the other so maybe if uh one party or the other party or all the parties involved think in the ultimate truth of their ideas or their claims or their convictions but then they will listen to the uh ideas of the others in this particular frame then they will try to come up with something which will resonate in the understanding of the other parties too so by understanding this uh, component of relationship in terms of identity in terms of interest in terms of power in terms of perception in terms of misperception and uh, stereotypes uh, this will actually lead to the creation of a situation in which 
the different parties may be able to not just understand but try to make sense of the claim of the other and even if they are not able to make sense of the claim of the other at least they will be able to understand their own things in a better manner and it takes a lot of time so it is not time bound so this takes time and occurs through the five stages of the process so how they actually practically do is uh, in the reading material you may find this in detail they have practiced this in different colleges of united states so what they did they, they, they did was they had the uh, uh, students from different backgrounds and they put them through this these stages and then after one set of talks second set of talk third set of talk fourth set of talk many sets of talk so uh, time was not a factor time they were actually giving a lot of time so in each stage different understanding was coming and the next uh, talk the next discussion was in some sense better than the previous one in terms of understanding of the ideas of or the claims of or the problems of the other and uh, this actually is So this actually goes through five uh, different stages, which is called the processes. And that actually is done by uh, how to engage the other party that is decided. So the first process is deciding to engage. The second process is mapping the relationship and naming the problems. So through the first stage of understanding, this second level, the second stage is uh, uh, undertaken or second stage is, 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 uh, is applied. And then the third is probing problems and relationships. So in that sustained dialogue initiative, the probing of the problem is done. So suppose, for example, from the point of view of one party, some problem might be the ultimate problem for everyone. But then in a dialogic spirit, all the other parties will sit together and they will try to uh, not just understand, but try to see the ideas of the other parties too. Then there is scenario building. There is scenario building as well as acting and learning together. Then within that frame, there is this scenario building that what might be the possibilities? What might be the end result of their process of dialogic uh, understanding? So that scenario building actually uh, give a sort of an empathetic understanding to a sort of uh, imp uh, understanding things from empathetic point of view. So you put yourself in other situations, then half of the problem may get solved. So the problem is suppose, for example, uh, this uh, problem of Israel and Palestinians are there. So if the element of empathy is brought in, then and in the real sense of the term then if one thinks himself or herself in the situation of the other, then that might be the beginning of reaching towards a, a, a joint course of action. So uh, the fourth aspect is scenario building as well as the fifth one is learning together. And through all these process, uh, which has actually been uh, practiced, which and put to practice by uh, different people, uh, it has been seen that uh, various conflicts, various protracted conflict has also begun to find some sort of uh, uh, capability to uh, overcome the existing conviction in terms of the idea of the different parties and trying to understand and trying to see the, uh, the, uh, the expectations or trying to see the ideas or trying to see the understanding of the other parties involved. So in this spirit, actually, uh, through this uh, sustained dialogue process, uh, uh, they, uh, they have actually also explained it in terms of uh, the scientific principles too, that uh, how the neurons of the mind actually function and how if you put yourself in a particular uh, uh, dialogic way, so uh, that might also uh, uh, do things in such a manner that uh, we will be able to empathetically understand the problems which other is facing. So this, in short, is the. Uh, I think I should stop here, 
and this sustained dialogue initiative is actually uh, being practiced by uh, the sustained dialogue institute in washington so that is actually being practiced by these people and they train also and they encourage the use of this method and that has been used by places like uh, 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 the nanson dialogue center and there are other dialogue centers which make use of this uh, dialogue process so i am uh, stopping it here i hope uh, this made some sense and i hope and i wish and we all should pray that the uh, the crisis the problem whatever should i say that should stop very quickly that humanitarian pause should happen and we should hear any time that the united nations security council have come up with the resolution to stop this endless killing of people in gaza <laughs> so i am stopping it here and i'm open to any question thank you thank you so much sir for such a stimulating it's really a wonderful and insightful session and i believe this is like a really wonderful and nice way of understanding the current crisis the modern crisis because more often they have their roots in the past and when we talk about enlightenment i completely agree with you that our learnings and understandings are very much rooted in the post enlightenment kind of an understanding and fashion we're fashioned to think in that way and by there if i i think if language shapes the way we think history should in every way then tell us what to and how to imagine the future and you have been like really wonderful the session has been really exciting and wonderful to help us understand the crisis in that way in that fashion and the potential of dialogue i mean you reflected upon it very nicely and very nicely i mean i have a comment not a question just a, an anecdote to the discussion i believe because we talked about the viability of dialogue in situation is where the power asymmetry does not exist there's a balance of power and some of us agree to that that dialogue works when we have equal parties the potentially equal parties on table and they talk about things it might not work in the situation is where we have weaker and stronger parties in question but i believe i mean contrary to that understanding i believe dialogue plays its role very much in those situations where the power asymmetry exists because dialogue has its applicability and its resonance and viability in those situations because otherwise in situations of power balance and equal sharing mechanisms dialogue might not be required because we have read it in international politics as well i mean there's a balance of power when parties are equally stronger so understanding the modern crisis the modern societies where we have imbalances we have asymmetries and inequalities persisting in every sphere of life and society i believe dialogue has a very crucial role to play in those works as well uh opening the discussion for questions and participants feedback no you can just raise your hand so unmute yourselves and go ahead uh, yes of course uh, mr amit a very uh, uh, good that you pointed this out actually that is the thing which i have pointed the uh, the potential of dialogue actually exist in a, a situation of asymmetric power because it is there that there is the only option Exactly. but then in order to explain that why it is no had has not worked so in that context uh, we discuss so of, of course yeah you're you're right and it is good that you made this point because maybe i uh, was not uh, i was not able to uh, properly maybe say but this actually is it is there where does uh, what other options do people have in the power of uh, in, in asymmetric uh, 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 relationship that is there but why it has not worked for example why oslo accord has not worked because that was a negotiation and that was asymmetry of power was there and dialogue was not uh, uh, understood or dialogue was not uh, uh, really uh, implemented that is the reason that it was not done so yes you are right good good uh, that you pointed so thank you So there are only two ways, Madam Mel. I say this to my uh, my students in my class too. There can be two inferences: either 
we have been very uh, we have detected the things which you all uh, it's very okay with you otherwise uh, you are not able to understand any of the thing i am not able to make sense so i hope someone of you will prove me wrong and then ask the question that's why yeah, we have the idiot yeah, huh? that's why we have the idiot majburi ka naam no prague it's not dialogue is not majburi ka naam aaj sunna hai so it's not you should have said it no 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 it's not like that no it's, it's just it's just that you mentioned it's in no, no of course it is I, i i mean i'm not denying it but this is like when you when you said that um you know why why we have uh, uh, why there's no option when you are in an asymmetrical power situation there is no option except dialogue so like when you said that 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 kind of reminded me of the idiom that that a lot should, of people say devise my what's yes of course good that you said i should say that is the best possible option there is a viable option right right the possible okay. option that is the viable option yes yes i should not uh, talk in this uh, in these terms yes okay thank you thank you sorry saida i i took the place of saida uh, yes saida yes uh, like sir uh, you, both of you have mentioned how dialogue works very well in power asymmetry or it has quite uh, it does not work very well but it is one of the viable option but sir when we uh, but like you had said that the meaning of dialogue is basically an uh, Uh, the purpose of dialogue is uh, interaction with the end goal of increased understanding but when we see the amount like for example the crisis in gaza or, or what we see is the, the power asymmetry is of such an extent that i don't i personally don't feel that dialogue over here anybody is willing to understand the other party one party that is overtly very powerful has an understanding and i don't think so there is any room that they are willing to even empathize or any such thing so where is dialogue actually playing a role here according to me dialogue plays a role in, at a very minimal level at the grassroots understanding of things but uh, in the sphere of international politics where it is brute realism that works that it is my way or or the highway i don't think so dialogue actually works uh thank you so then uh, so should uh, uh, mr moderator muzammil should we take two three questions at one go and uh, answer or uh, should i respond uh, one, one one by one whatever is convenient to you you can respond to this and then we take another question maybe okay uh so uh yes yeah, so can uh, again uh, you have highlighted the obvious reality but then the thing is this is the existing this is the this is the apparent reality which is in front of us all but then we also have to see that the current world is actually working again i'll say in a very power monistic terms but this may not be the only way there are alternative ways too which could have worked but that didn't okay so though this is a reality that there is so much of power asymmetry between these to the uh, uh, people of gaza and uh, israel and uh, the might of the world but then where the idea of dialogue appeals is the pre pon uh, city of par the preponderance of par that actually is not then again we go back to the original idea of our security is so security from the point of view of understanding in hard core terms or security from the point of view of understanding in terms of emancipation so from the point of view of emancipatory politics what finally the israelis are finally doing finally at the end of the day they have to all any party in any conflict have to sit at the table so even if it is not working in this particular situation that doesn't mean that the potential of this doesn't hold you are obviously right the manner in which is it not that it is because of the dialogic mechanism that the palestinians were able to highlight or bring to the light of the wider public their plight what other options it is it is the only viable option they had to put their voice and 
let the other feel the plight of Gazans, the plight of Palestinians. So yes, you are right that as of now, when we see the, or you can say there is the failure of all sorts of uh, uh, negotiation which has, has happened. Where the potential of dialogue lies is the site where it provides ample of opportunity in the hands of those who do not have any other mechanism, who do not have any other means to appeal to the good sense of, to appeal to the ideas of the wider masses or the wider public. Okay? So it is here where the importance of dialogue lies. But you are right that as of now in international politics, dialogue actually may not seem to work. Okay? Again, I'll invoke Gramsci and uh, ask us all to be hopeful in at least underlining the fact or understanding the fact that, see, the manner in which the support for the people of Gaza could be seen all over the world in the street. How could that have been possible? That could only be, a, I should not say only, uh, Narang has rightly po pointed this out, that could in a, in a, in a, in one of the way could be understood in terms of dialogue as a, not as a process, but as a relationship. Okay. So can't uh, we see that uh, there are groups within uh, the uh, within Israel? There are different groups. There is just just one particular group, which actually is going in for pouncing, pounding Gaza indiscriminately, pounding bombs and others. But then there are at the same time there are other groups, which are there, and which despite the fact that they will in they will incur the wrath of their government, is still they are coming out in support that the. So how could it have been possible? This is the, you can say the visual uh, dialogue. Because by seeing things, they are, they are, they may consider themselves to be in that situation. So that feeling of empathy is being generated. So maybe after some time, so of course, uh, it will take a lot of time. There is a lot of uh, killing which has already happened. But still, this provides a uh, a, a, a viable way through which the uh, uh, the existing or whatever is left, what uh, 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 that could be. Um, but 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 yes, of course you are right that uh, in the current given reality, it seems to not work, and it is just something which seems to be. That is why I began my discussion with not with uh, high hopes, but by quoting how since the time since the earlier time. The situation was, and in the current 21st century, the situation is. So what we need to do is we need to tap the existing potential which we have as a young uh, scholar, as a young student, as a youngster, to tap on the sites, to tap on the sites which could be utilized for the promotion of the idea of a peaceful world or a better world through reconciliation, through, through peace processes, peace building processes, and through utilizing the creative potential of and the learning potential of dialogue. So we all fully agree with you. You are right. But then a beginning needs to be met. And that beginning actually is provided by this mechanism of dialogue. I'm not sure if it answers your query, but then this is what it is. Uh, Zikra, you can go ahead with your question. Uh, there's some question. Uh, someone has. That's why we have the image. So. Good evening, everyone. Am I audible? Yes, yes, Zikra. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you so much for the beautiful lecture. Uh, so my question is, how can as an individual and uh, as a community contribute to the building resilience? and the hope in the face of fragile world, as we already discussed uh, that dialogue uh, in some situation doesn't work. So as an individual, what we can do to face this situation? Okay. Uh, I think to be very honest, uh, 
we all are grappling with this because in the current, uh, particularly since this uh, uh, war began and this uh, Israeli bombing has started in, and the way the, despite the international public opinion, despite the enormous, the streets of London, the streets of all the cities of the world, most of the cities of the world, they're full with people asking for humanitarian pause. As basic a thing as asking for a basic ceasefire in the light of the flagrant violation of international law and the international institution are paralyzed. So we have reasons to feel quite dejected, quite uh, bad. We have reasons to feel quite pessimistic. But then we need not leave it at that because at least a beginning is being met. There are people who are still trying. So when once the Security Council resolution failed, people tried to bring that to the General Assembly. When General Assembly overwhelmingly supported, even after that, there were there are other attempts which is being made in order to. So this is the uh, test of our patience. So what we need to do is the first thing, and this time I will say Narang is not there. The only thing which is in our hand, which is with us, and that is not to lose hope. I all the time keep saying this in the class. So Kana is my student, a student, and she will be la laughing. So maybe she is here, though she's she, she's not laughing, but she love all the time. We say we did this possibility of bringing changes and 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 peace. That that hope should not be lost. Whatever happens, so still we should keep trying. And we always say that the beginning should be met from the by inculcating these things in the mind. The way we have been. The problem is that individualistic society, we are basing ourselves everything on the basis of profit and loss. So this needs to change. So the basic idea of us, which is inculcated in us through our education, that needs to change. So all the time what happens in the school where you are studying, so everyone is obsessed with achieving first position. First position at whatever cost. So that, that thinking needs to change. So there needs to be reprogramming of the mind. There needs to be, and there should be at least a beginning. And that should beginning should be from the way the primary education is imparted to students and all of us. Because uh, the we are in the era of artificial intelligence now. So it's high time that we set our priorities. I will not say that it is now or never, or as Sukana said, it is my way or highway. I'll not say this. But the thing is, it is high time that there needs to be a reorientation. There needs to be re-understanding. There needs to be uh, uh, there needs to be effort put in putting things to proper perspective by changing the manner in which we understand things. This all the time I keep say, uh, saying this that this power monistic understanding of the world that needs to change. The creative potential of uh, the, 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 or what Gandhi talked in terms of Swaraj in the real sense of the term. So Swaraj is not actually uh, exercising your sovereignty over others. Swaraj is actually exercising your so sovereignty over yourself. So we need to emphasize the ideas of uh, scholars, uh, prophets, and scholars like, or, and practitioners like Gandhi and others more. So, this idea of maximization of the profit, everything in terms of getting more marks, everything in terms of uh, just uh, uh, being the best, being things which is of good for us only, that idea needs to change. So Zikra, that can be a beginning. And that beginning, because you all are youngsters, uh, you, you cannot, we all cannot afford to lose hope. So the beginning could be from the new generation of people. See, what happened? The world war happened. First world war happened, there was attraction everywhere. But that didn't prevent people from making that institution called League of Nations. Second world war happened. The destruction, Hiroshima, Nagasaki and others. But then United Nations came into existence, though it's not functioning. But at least there is a mechanism where people are. So maybe in times to come, with hope and with conviction, we may be able to at least make the world what the 
uh, what is said about the United Nations, at least make the world a better place to live. If not make it a heaven, at least prevent it from becoming a hell. So the only, the best thing which we have to do is to not lose hope and be hopeful and keep doing our, bar, our part, keep doing our part. Thank you, sir. Pragya has a hand up. Pragya, you can unmute and go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Dr. Uh, Raza. So um, I think one one thing that comes to my mind is uh, that, you know, when we, let's say, talk of religious conflicts or dialogues, uh, a lot of times religious conflicts are on the surface, but inside that it, it is the, the conflict or the, is, is really, you know, a conflict on resources or a conflict on, you know, is, 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 is it's economics, right? Like we, we looked at partition of India and Pakistan. We thought that, you know, everything that happened, that was a lot, uh, it, it seemed religious, but a lot of times it was, uh, you know, it was for property or for, you know, uh, for, for taking over the leftover resources or even in Israel, Israel, Palestine, it, you know, so how do we differentiate between, so when we sit in, on a dialogue table, how do we, um, you know, how do we differentiate or how do we know what is actually a real religious conflict and what is, uh, because for a dialogue pra practitioner to be able to have the wisdom to make the difference is sometimes the lines are very blurred. What do we do in that case? Uh, that's a very important point I actually wanted to flag in. Uh, but then the discussion became a different. But yes, you are uh, quite right. Uh, the problem is that what we have done is in the secular tradition, what happened is religion was not taken as a thing. Religion was sidelined, marginalized, not taken into account. Okay, so that provided ample of avenues in the hands of those who where with different uh, 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 intentions, they utilize that aspect of religion, which were helpful to them in the pursuit of their own selfish interest. So the problem is the, the religion actually allowed itself to be utilized by those who made use of it for all the wrongful purposes. Uh, this is uh, 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 an obvious fact that uh, people talk about the uh, the 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 uh, uh, problem uh, the the fact that dialogue is not going to do anything because this is a, a very uh, widely held belief that when the religious crusades were taking place during the earlier period, medieval era, before the religious crusade. There had been a lot of dialogue between the uh, Christian uh, priests and Muslim scholars. But the religious crusades were preceded by that interaction. But that didn't prevent. Why? Because that actually didn't happen in the dialogic spirit. And that was hijacked by those people who had their own selfish interests to follow. So what needs to be done is that Religion should be given proper space. Religion should be accounted for. And that actually of late is it is being realized. After 1990s, there has been burgeoning literature which asks for there are scholars like Paul Appleby, which has who have said that there is the return of religion in international politics and international relations, particularly because scholars, a lot of scholars, but people like uh, Samuel P. Huntington and others, they they actually uh, uh, propagated things in a manner which attributed all the negative things to religion. So religion is not to be left alone. And in that Western secular liberal tradition, the separation of the church and the state, that model was imposed on all other conflicts and all other areas. So that also actually provided a lot of problems. So a model which might have worked for you, that could not be. So it's all about the, the imposition of the Western models, the American model, and the uh, part of the problem that in Middle East problem is still consist, uh, persist is because of the fact that we have not been able to account for the existing realities, the things which you have said, because the society have a different makeup. 
there are different ways in which societies uh, interact. Before 1948, I'll say, or before 1920s, I'll say, uh, to be more uh, accurate. Uh, all the three Abrahamic religions were living in, in not say perfect harmony, but there was no, not so much of clash. So Palestinians were there, but then it was hijacked by the Zionists. And the manner in, it, in which the Zionists are opposed by the Jews. You might have seen those uh, Ashkemized Jews, what Jews they say, they wear long coats and then they criticize Israel and uh, in, 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 in the most severest form. Okay? So, yes, you are right that it is actually the utilization of the negative aspect of, or you can say, the clever utilization of the religious uh, things. In, uh, because all religion talks about the essential unity of humankind. Religion talks about compassion. Religion talks about fellow feeling. Religion doesn't say to kill anyone. And if it is there, that is in times of the existential crisis. That doesn't fit now. So suppose, for example, now, Netanyahu invoking the idea that the Palestinians are Amalek. That is a clever pathological use of religion. Okay. So uh, it's very important that we bring religion, we give proper space to religion. We should not consider uh, the usual cause and the usual way is that if someone from the religious background comes and talks, then we we think that they're talking in, uh, in they're not talking sense, they're talking politics. Okay. So this thinking needs to, there needs to be a lot of uh, uh, change at the point of the episteme, the way the sources of the knowledge, where from the knowledge is coming. Even the secular tradition, which we talk about, if you go to the root of those secular tradition, Hugo Gracious, Immanuel Kant, they are the people who gave rise to this enlightenment tradition. They were religious people. Okay. So I think it, this is not a, a proper answer to this, but then I think uh, that uh, religion must be given. And there has been a lot of work on this, this ambivalence of the sacred by Paul Appleby, uh, Mark Gopin, there's a lot of scholars who are working on this. So it's it's a project in process. And, you, and, and, and yes, you are right that uh, religion most of the time, as we see now, is actually utilized for all the wrong, uh, wrongful things, wrongful purposes. So it is the clever, problematic use of religion, rather religion per se. Okay, so that is the thing. Yeah, thank you. So Munir has his hand up. Munir, you can unmute and go ahead, please. Oh uh, yeah, thank you, sir. So I don't have a question. Uh, some questions precisely. But I wanted to uh, comment on certain things. Uh, to be very honest and not being a uprising of a person, though the uh, topic of the session was very fascinating, it wasn't up to the mark in its presentation at all. I would think so. I'm not sure about other people. Also, the persons uh, that Sir mentioned about Martin Buber and David Baum and all, uh, it's a definition of dialogue they have presented, but uh, the very nuances of those dialogue when Martin Buber just make, makes it self-centric in his treatise I and Dow and others was terribly mis, you know, not included. Also, it was a hodgepodge of things, religion, uh, international conflict, Israel, Palestine, and protracted conflict, ambivalence of the sacred. So it did not fall in a chronological or in a you know systematic manner so that we could have uh, understood it in a better way. Also, I think that uh, Sir is uh, saying things about religion or in the answer to the question by Pragya ma'am, uh, that uh, there were crusades, uh, but before that, uh, Abrahamic religions were living very peacefully with each other. I think that's a very terrible misinformation to have, because when you categorize people in terms of infidels and non-believers and kafirs and not, that is just as, as hostility as it can be. So it does not mean anything if you are having a tribal harmony just for tribal resources. And uh, you have seen uh, people of uh, Medina fighting with Jews uh, for the reasons whether they break their treatises, whether they fight for resources and other things, 
also we have seen uh, jihads we have seen taliban rule th- that is pertaining to religion the, the taliban is not using religion for its own sake that's for the after world they claim to be khomeini does the same thing jews and zionists claim the same thing and when we say the biblical tradition the idea of reconciliation comes from b- biblical tradition the idea of discord the idea of uh, uh, you know uh, disharmony the idea of very much racism as uh, people uh, the sons of shem the sons of amalek these are also from the biblical so why do we consider idea of reconciliation and shun away with other things i don't think that is a thing to do and yes this is there is n- uh, n- no religion actually makes it clear that we are you know the existential humanity or the ultimate humanity there is no such thing even if we are called humans the basic identity we are given is religious identity that's why if humans were the uh, things considered then there would have been no heaven and hell things there would have been no differences but we are called muslims and hindus and polytheists and non polytheists that's why we have so much a problem and abrahamic religions have the be- just terrible problem of being monotheist that you believe in one god and if you believe in one god you are going to have terrible fights among people there is no room for tolerance actually let alone acceptance and you know embracing of other things so i don't think how do how do we follow these things and how sustain dialogue is a is even a question to be incorporated in abrahamic religions and in terms of religious dialogue and harmony thank you yeah, uh, thank you uh, munir uh, kind of you you are right you are actually right and that what uh, i was actually thinking uh, that in order to incorporate so many things it would have seemed like this but then this exactly is the thing which is there in any talk in which religion is involved so because we have been programmed to think think of things in terms of a western liberal secular tradition that whenever the term religion comes we become aware of the things which has been propagated by so there is it that uh, if suppose for example uh, there is this for that matter if you go in for this still again start a debate between the secular and the religious we are not going into the debate of secular and the religious but the thing is suppose for example we think and we have been programmed to think like this that the idea of nation state the idea of nationalism which is valid till the point when the state boundary exists that is an okay thing and not highlighting the idea of humanity so why is it that we are highlighting the importance of for example religion in terms of the people of the different religion kafir for example or other things so it's during that time it has been debated by scholars it has been written by a lot of scholars that was in terms of the existential crisis of that time so if someone uh infers that idea of kafir now in this current uh, mode so that may not be the correct religious interpretation of the things but they may be deb- it may be debated so with respect to other things too uh the manner in which religion has again i will say the manner in which religion has been put to use because of the gaze which has been given to us by the tradition in which our learning has we have we have learned the things the manner in which we have understood the things that manner in which we have the the, the very the origin of knowledge is there so that actually is the uh, thing which paints religion in uh, so for example uh, uh, when i said that uh, the religious uh, crusade were preceded by dialogue the dialogues happen between the and they say it the dialogue between questions and but that couldn't prevent the uh, uh, crusade but then this also can be seen that how crusade ended how crusade came to an end so at that time was some secular principle or again there was the invocation of, of the idea of the religion the invocation of the idea of the essential unity of mankind human kind humanity essential unity of humanity so which part we are emphasizing that is there in the ambivalence ambivalence of the sacred that which part we are emphasizing so as of now in order to bring peace in order to uh, to do away with the uh, problems which is existing or the apparent killing of people and other things in the name of religion 
or for example the concept of jihad so a lot has been uh, discussed related to the concept of jihad what actually jihad is so maybe the secularist the ultra secularist they will say that jihad is what jihad is fighting with the others but then the if you talk it with the scholars muslim scholars they will say that what is jihad jihad is internal struggle jihad actually is something doing away with the wrong so if you see command uh, uh, commanding right and forbidding wrong that is the essence of religion so if you ask someone what is the essence of for example hinduism buddhism islam other religions they will say the that is the essential unity of mankind humankind and humanity it has been put to use by what narang said actually in a context by the The, the the moment the hierarchy and the power relationship came the moment that christianity was converted into papism or the moment uh, islam was converted into the different uh, 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 structures so that actually is the problem they utilize religion in for a particular reason so but you are right the whatever things you are saying uh, mr monir that actually is right that actually has been there in the popular domain more therefore we we, we know about those things more we have not shifted our gaze or we have given equal attention so the gaze has been fixated to a particular area so my point is my humble suggestion is you are right my humble suggestion is that we need to shift our gaze in such a manner that the other aspects of religion also need to be looked into so for example when we said that when i said that uh, they were living comparatively in a bit uh, in a in a not that sort of conflictual relationship between before 1948 what i mean to say that religion was not used to kill people so at that time it was not a perfect harmony there might have been problem so problem happened within the family too but then to think that religion is the only thing which has created the problem that may not be a i will not say the proper way but that needs to be understood from different perspective so the reason the uh, the uh, uh, the reason we whenever the talk of uh, the uh, liberating potential of religion is utilized this is how things are uh, projected so we need to uh, put our gaze in such a manner that all the different aspects need to be uh, at least given a proper place or at least needs to be uh, given a proper uh, understanding and as regards the uh, uh, maybe uh, not very proper connected way of uh, the lecture yes you are right i also think because there are lot many things and particularly when you are talking about uh, forging peace in a fragile world in a situation like this so this is obvious to happen so but then good thank you thank you for your comment thank you so much sir and thanks to all the participants for joining i guess we have now run out of time and before we wrap up the session i again thank bazad sir for giving us the opportunity and tahsin sir for sharing his inputs and insights to make this session an insightful one and to the participants for making this a vibrant and interactive session and before we close the session i guess it's very important to highlight that we all agree that dialogue is anything now and it cannot work in vacuum i believe and there are preconditions that need to be satisfied for it to work so if the crises around us do not seem to settle i mean there's a little room to blame that dialogue is not working because dialogue needed other conditions to be satisfied before it could actually provide any viable solutions to us but in any way uh it remains to be a site of critical analysis a site of intellectual scrutiny and in our subsequent sessions with other eminent speakers we'll be speaking and probing further into the trajectories that need to be satisfied to ensure that dialogue works in societies at local levels and also at the international level so on that note again i'm thankful to all of you for making this session so stimulating and thought provoking and we hope that we see a more just a more dialogical and a more peaceful world in the coming days in the coming times
थैंक यू थैंक यू ऑल थैंक यू ऑल थैंक यू सर